In response to a video version of the first D&D &D and Racism essay I did, our viewer posted as part of their comments to, quote, Yet another racist feeling guilt trying to project their racism onto others, but this one attempting to use logic and his appeal to superiority with his college knowledge. I do not know whether this was a sincere criticism or mere trolling, but the tactics employed are common enough in today's politics to be worth addressing critically, because not because of someone being critical of me, but because this is something that's commonly done. And so the idea is to look through it to see if there's any merit to this, and if not, how to recognize the lack of merit, or if it is merit, to recognize the merit. Now there's a lot going on in that single sentence, which is itself, interestingly enough, a rhetorical tactic, which could be seen as analogous to throwing matches in a dry forest. Throwing the matches is quick and easy, but putting out the small fires they start takes time and effort. But if they are not addressed, the match thrower can claim they've scored points. This creates a nasty dilemma. If you take time to respond to these tossed matches, you're using way more time than the attacker. So even if you win, you win little because they've invested so little in these attacks. But if you do not respond, then they can claim victory. Now this would be also an error, logically speaking, on their part. A lack of response does not prove that a claim is correct. In fact, to infer that there was no response, therefore my claim is correct or the person agrees with me, would be a mistaken logic. Now the reference to using logic and my college knowledge, I like that rhyme, uh, seemed to be an attempt at a common tactic I've addressed before, which is the argument against expertise, or an argument against authority. It occurs when a person rejects a claim because it is made by an authority or expert. And if you want to be formal about it, it's got the formal form of premise 1, authority or expert A makes claim C, Conclusion, claim C is false. While experts can obviously be wrong, to infer that an expert is wrong because they're an expert would be absurd and clearly mistaken reasoning. For example, if someone takes their car to a mechanic and you ask them, hey, what's wrong with it? And they say to you, well, I know for sure it's not the engine. And you say, why? Well, the mechanic said the problem was most likely in the engine, and yeah, they've spent, you know, years working as a mechanic, but they're an expert at, you know, cars, so they are wrong. Now, as I've noted in other videos and other essays over the years, you know, talking specifically about the argument from authority, while experts can, of course, be wrong, to infer that an expert is wrong because they're an expert is obviously absurd and an error in reasoning. Now, the person is also using an ad hominem and a straw man attack against me. And again, I'm, my reason for being uh, addressing this is not because I'm, I'm mad because someone used an ad hominem straw man. It's because this is a very common tactic. And so the whole point of this is to note like why this is bad logic. Uh, and it's especially important because this is a super common tactic. So in the video, I explicitly note that I'm giving my credentials to establish credibility. And I also note that I should not be believed simply because I'm an expert in philosophy. So because I have a PhD in philosophy, written a lot about ethics, you know, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also not because I'm an expert in gaming, that I've been gaming for decades, I've been writing professionally in a long time, et cetera. My arguments stand or fall on their own merit. I don't make an argument from authority let alone an appeal to superiority. The whole point of that was to say, hey, look, this is a field I work in. I've been gaming a long time. I'm not just some rando, rando commenting on something I know nothing about. But I'm not saying I'm right because I'm an expert in it. Uh, my point is, look at the arguments to see if they're good or bad. As such, the accusation of 
appeal to superiority, which I, I rather like that. Um, not, you know, that it's a good line of reasoning, but uh, that it is, you know, you know, clearly a, an interesting type of fallacy. Now, this accusation is utterly unfounded, but does provide an excellent example of combining a straw man with an ad hominem, which is a very common tactic where someone presents their opponent as somebody that they're not, and then says, look how terrible this straw man is, and therefore my opponent is wrong. So these are common bad faith tactics, and it's wise to know them for what they are. I now turn to the focus of this video, the main focus, what is the tactic of accusing critics of racism of being the real racist? That is to say, you're the racist. This tactic is a very common one, and is a go-to tactic of President Trump whenever he does racist things and people say, hey, you shouldn't be doing those racist things. And he says back, essentially, accusing them of being a racist. And he picked that up from others, and of course others pick it up from him. So, worth considering even though, as we'll see, as you might guess, terrible logic. Now, the easy part of this, you're the racist thing, to address is the reference to guilt arising from being racist. So even if a person, say me, is motivated by guilt, this is irrelevant to the truth of their claims. It is just another ad hominem attack. This person is guilty, therefore they're wrong. Now, as far as projecting racism, again, this is just part of the claim that the critic of racism must be racist. While the accusation of racism can be seen as a mere rhetorical device, there does often seem to be an implied argument behind it. And some people do actually take the time to develop a argument for their accusation of racism. Let's look at some of the versions of this, this argument. So the first version is this. A person makes a criticism about some aspect of racism or a particular racist. So the, it's concluded, therefore, the person making the criticism is racist because of that criticism. And I put the formal form there uh, if one wishes to be you know, <laughs> bored with logic. While this is not a specific name fallacy, it doesn't have a name yet, although one could, of course, name it, the conclusion does not fall from the premise, which is why it's a fallacy. How do we know this? Well, consider the same sort of logic, which is obviously flawed. Person A makes a criticism about an aspect of corruption or a corrupt person. Therefore, that person is a corrupt person because of their criticism. Now, being critical of corruption or a corrupt person does not make you corrupt. While a corrupt person could be critical of corruption or another corrupt person, their criticism is not evidence of corruption. Two other bad arguments are as follows. So a variant version, equally bad as this. A person makes a criticism about some aspect of racism or a racist. Second premise, person is a racist because of this. Conclusion that are, you know, the racism or the racist are not racist. While this is not a civic name fallacy, it is still bad logic. Even if a person were a racist, it would not follow that R is not a racist um, or a racist, you know, policy. Once again, consider the analogy with corruption. So the first premise is that a person makes a criticism about some aspect of corruption or a corrupt person. Then the next premise is, is that the person is corrupt because of this. Therefore, that aspect of corruption or that corrupt person is not corrupt. Now again, the, the badness of this reasoning should be evident. If it were good logic, any accusation of corruption would be automatically false. So at this point, it can be pointed out that while these bad arguments are in fact really used, there are potentially good arguments that prove that being critical of racism or racist 
makes a person a racist or proves their criticism is false. So what we're looking for is good arguments that would do this. Now, I do agree that there are cases in which critics of certain types of racism are racist. The most easy and obvious example would be the Nation of Islam. They assert, on theological grounds, that blacks are innately superior to whites. Someone who believes this could be critical of racism against blacks, and they would thus be a racist criticizing racism of a particular type. But it's not their criticism of racism that makes them racist. It is their racism that makes them racist. Now, even if everyone who is critical of racism happened to be racist, it would not follow that their criticism makes them racist. It is their racism that makes them racist. What is needed is an argument showing that it is being critical of racism or a racist that makes one racist, and not that one happens to be a racist criticizing racism. That is, if the only information you had about a person was the full text of their criticism, you'd be able to reliably infer from the criticism that they are racist. Obviously enough, if the criticism contained racism, you know, like a Nation of Islam member criticizing white racism because of their view that blacks are inherently superior to whites, one could do this easily. But to assume that every criticism of racism or races must contain racism because it is a criticism of racism would simply beg the question. Also, pointing to racists who make a criticism of racism and inferring that all critics who make that same criticism are thus racist would be to fall into the guilt by association fallacy. And of course, even if a critic were a racist, it would be an ad hominem to infer their criticism is thus false. Now, while the ideal argument would show that all criticisms of racism make one racist, and even better, disprove the criticism, such an argument would seem suspiciously powerful. It would show that every critic of racism is a racist and perhaps even automatically disprove any criticisms about racism. Probably the best way to argue for such an argument is to focus on showing that being critical of racism requires criticizing people based on their race and then making a case for why this is racist. The idea seems to be that being critical of racism requires accepting race and using it against other races, or one's own, thus being racist. But this seems absurd if one considers the following analogy. Imagine, if you will, a world even more absurd than our own. In this world, no one developed the idea of race. Instead, people were divided up by their earlobes. Now, broadly speaking, humans have two types of earlobes. One is the free earlobe, the lobe hangs beyond the attachment point of the ear to the head. The other is the, is the attached ear lobe. It attaches directly to the head. In this absurd world, the free lobed were lauded as better in important ways than the attached lobe. Free lobe scientists and writers asserted that the free lobed are smarter, more civilized, less prone to crime, and so on for all the virtues. In contrast, the attached lobed were presented as bestial, savage, criminal, stupid, and immoral, and thus lobism was born. The attached lobed were enslaved for a long period of time, then freed. After that, there were systematic efforts to oppress the attached lobed. The progress could not be denied. For example, a person with partially attached lobed was elected president but there are still many problems attributed to lobism. In this weird world, some people are critical of lobism and argue that aside from the appearance of the earlobes, there is no biological difference between the groups. Would it make sense to infer that their criticism of lobism entails that they are lobist? That is, that they have prejudice against the free lobed, discriminate against them, and so on. 
Does it entail that they believe that Loeb's claims are real? That the Loeb's determine all these other factors, such as morality, intelligence, and so on? Well, if critics of racism must be racist, then critics of Loebism must be Loebist. If one of us went to that world and were critical of Loebism, then we would thus be Loebist if this reasoning is good. But this seems absurd. One can obviously be critical of Loebism or racism without being a Loebist or racist.